Hi, I'm Pastor David Wendell, Assistant to the Bishop for Ministry and Ecumenism in the North American Lutheran Church. This is my sermon for the fourth Sunday in Lent. The Gospel reading is from St. Luke, the 15th chapter, verses 1 through 3 and 11b to 32. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. And he said, There was a man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the share of property that falls to me. And he divided his living between them. Not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took his journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in loose living. And when he had spent everything, a great famine arose in that country, and he began to be in want. So he went and joined himself to one of the citizens of that country, who sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have fed on the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, but I perish here with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But while he was yet at a distance, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and make merry for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to make merry. Now his elder son was in the field and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what this meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come and your father has killed the fatted calf because he has received him safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, Lo, these many years I have served you and I never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a kid that I might make merry with my friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your living with harlots, you killed for him the fatted calf. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to make merry and be glad. For this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and is found. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The words of St. Paul in our second lesson from 2 Corinthians chapter 5 today can be a bit perplexing. Paul writes, from now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. If anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old has passed away. See, everything has become new. And what can be confusing about Paul's words is the suggestion that we no longer regard anyone from a human point of view. And it's perplexing isn't it? Because we do regard others from a human point of view. It would be great if we could view others from the perspective of God in Christ Jesus. 
who in Jesus has given us a ministry of healing and reconciliation. But it doesn't work that way for most of us. We're not that good at viewing others with reconciliation in mind. We are not such good ambassadors for Christ, proclaiming and living the message of reconciliation. Rather, we continue to regard others from a decidedly human point of view. Take the parable Jesus tells in our gospel lesson for today. We look at this all too familiar tale and we find much in it that is baffling from a human point of view. Oh, the so-called prodigal son, most of us understand because from a human point of view, such rebellion against authority, even and especially the authority of one's own parent, is part and parcel of growing up in the world as we know it. We've seen such blatant, ignorant action in our own families, in our own households, maybe in our own lives, as sometimes we ourselves have been the rebellious son or daughter, taking what our parents will give us and heading off to seek our fortune, only to end up penniless, ashamed, crawling back home, having squandered what was given to us, hoping mom and dad will let us live rent-free in their basement. That all-too-human rejection of one's parental units we can grasp, because many of us have been there, whether as children or as parents. And we have to say, from a human point of view, we can also relate to the older brother, who is the steady, stable one, who is the one who has really earned the father's trust and love by not rebelling, by not going off on a wasteful journey that ends in disaster. From a human perspective, the elder brother has every right to be jealous and angry when the younger returns and is welcomed and even celebrated. What most of us don't understand is the reaction of the father. We see his actions and consider him in his own way as, as being as wasteful and profligate as the younger son. Many human fathers would have disowned their son, refused to receive him back, been fine with letting the younger son work alongside the servants. From a human point of view, the father should have practiced a little tough love, shouldn't have made it so easy on the errant child, should have appreciated the reliable responsibleness of the elder brother by not welcoming the younger home with open arms. All in all, the behavior of the father makes little sense from a human way of seeing all that was transpiring. And yet that's what St. Paul is saying in his letter to the Corinthians. That in Christ, we are not to see things from a human point of view that we're not supposed to judge things from the human perspective of rewards and punishments. For in Christ, the new eyes of faith see not so much from the worldly lenses of retributive justice, tit for tat, you do this, you get punished, you do that, and you get rewarded. Rather, in Christ, the new way of looking is through the 3D glasses of reconciliation, mercy, and forgiveness. That's what the parable of the prodigal son is meant to teach us. That's the new point of view the scriptures are offering to us, that we may begin in Christ to regard others as new creations, as we ourselves live as the new creations that we are in Christ Jesus. Because that's the trouble, really, isn't it? We don't regard others as new creations in Christ because we are not living as the new creations God has created us to be through the death and resurrection of Jesus. 
In him we are now to be new creations. The old you and me have passed away, and we are to be new people in Christ Jesus. We just find it hard to live that way in our day-to-day -day existence. Rather than live as the godly resurrection people we are, we continue to live as worldly, secular people who look at things the way every other worldly, secular person looks at things in everyday life. We judge others. We criticize others. We hold on to grudges. We refuse to forgive for what we consider to be very good and justified reasons. When someone wrongs us or our parents or our kids, when someone acts ignorantly and causes us or our loved ones harm, when we see others act in ways that are disrespectful, destructive, and contrary to the common good, we naturally react in ways that may be unduly harsh and judgmental unwilling to be taken advantage of. We're unwilling to be anyone's patsy. We don't like to be seen as weak or vulnerable because that can invite even greater abuse. So we stand tall and we stand strong against what we perceive as those who may be treating us wrongly. And from a human way of thinking, that's what real life requires. And yet the parable Jesus tells us today is aimed at getting us to at least imagine a different way of reacting. The parable that we heard Jesus tell today is brilliant in that it helps us to see how a father might react differently to a rebellious disobedient younger son and his prideful, judgmental older sibling. The parable is wonderful in that we see ourselves in it in so many different ways. We are the younger son. We are the older brother. And yet we are not often so much the loving, forgiving father which confronts us with our behavior, which is so often unloving, unmerciful, and unforgiving. And there, in this simple parable, we see the two ways of regarding and treating people, from a human perspective or from a divine perspective. From a truly divine perspective, because what Jesus is suggesting here is not first that you and I are the father, but first that you and I are the younger or older sons. And that God, that God is the forgiving, merciful father. So that we see in the father God, the very love and compassion and acceptance and welcome that God offers to each of us in spite of ourselves. For whether we are the younger or the older son, whether our sin is rebelliousness, greed, or a dissolute way of life as with the younger son, or arrogance, selfishness, and an unforgiving attitude as with the elder, the message is that God loves each of us and both of us equally and with the same mercy and grace. As St. Augustine once said, God loves each of us as if there were only one of us. That is divine love. And that is the love that we are to manifest because we have been loved completely by our Father. Loved by our Father, not with a hesitant, uncertain love, but with a love that has our Father running to meet us, showering us with his gifts of grace, providing for us a banquet, a banquet of love as we come together at the Lord's table to receive not the fatted calf, but the Lamb of God, 
slaughtered, sacrificed, to celebrate that the dead are now alive. The lost have been found. There is a chance for reconciliation and forgiveness. And so to seal that, we are invited to celebrate at a feast offered in our honor. That's what it means to see not from a human perspective, but from a divine point of view. As we are called to love as we've been loved, to show mercy as we've been shown mercy, to forgive as we've been forgiven. And that's why we are now called to be ourselves ambassadors of Christ. Because we are reconciled to God the Father through Jesus Christ, because we are loved and forgiven, we are now to live lives of love and mercy and forgiveness. Whether in our homes or families, whether at work or out in the world, and yes, especially within the body of Christ, we are to love and forgive as we have been loved and forgiven. We are to be reconcilers and peacemakers as ambassadors of Jesus Christ. This is what it means for us to be new creations in Christ Jesus. St. Chrysostom, connecting Paul's description with the image of the Father clothing his son with the best robe in the parable of the prodigal son, writes, Here Paul shows that those who, by their faith in Christ, have put off like an old cloak the burden of their sins, have now been illumined in the light of justification, having received this new and shining cloak, this royal robe, this is why Paul said, if any man is in Christ, he is a new creature. May our old ways and our old way of seeing things be cast off like an old cloak as we return to our loving, forgiving Father this Lenten season and let us receive anew the best robe that as new creations in Christ, we might live new lives, lives of love, lives of mercy and forgiveness every day for the rest of our lives. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit,